Alta Labs has sent one of the first routers they've ever made over to us. And for those of you who don't know, this thing is marketed as a 10 gigabit per second device. Now, before we go too far into the hardware features of this, let's first quickly take a look at everything that comes in the box currently. In the box, you get a quick start guide, a wall mount and screws with anchors. The power brick can supply up to 70 watts of power, 1.3 amps or 54 volts and it's also a barrel connector. And then you also get various plug types for the US and the EU. For anyone wondering, the cable length is about 58 inches, and that was measured from the tip of the connector all the way to the point where it connects to the power brick itself. One strange thing that they did not include with the Route 10 are actually the plastic plugs that they have included with their other products that protect the SFP or SFP Plus ports from any debris that may get in there. I find it strange that it was left out for this device, but maybe it was just an oversight and that's something they'll fix in the future. Enough with the unboxing crap, it's time to talk about the hardware itself. What are we waiting for? I don't know, you I guess. Let's start talking about it. Stop wasting my time. Starting from the front of the device, we have the reset button and then our first WAN port or WAN 1. We have our first LAN port, and this is PoE Plus capable. We have our second LAN port that is also PoE Plus capable. Our third LAN port, and all four of these Ethernet ports are 2.5 gigabit capable. Moving on to the two SFP Plus ports, our first one on the left is our fourth WAN port that is, of course, 10 gig capable. And then the second one is our SFP Plus WAN port that is 10 gig capable as well. On the rear side of the device, we have a loop so you can connect it to your keychain and walk around town with your sweet swag. And then we also have the barrel connector for the power input. Note this is not USB-C like their other device, probably because this thing provides so much more power. Additionally, for those of you that are curious, the back plane has a max throughput support of 25 gigabit per second, which is pretty healthy. And of course, that statistic was provided by Alta Labs. Unfortunately, that's not something I can test. So I'll just have to take that at face value and maybe that's something we can put to the test in the future. Now, before we power on the device for the first time, I know you guys wanna see this. Let's go ahead and crack it open and void that warranty. So opening it should be pretty simple, just like some of their previous products. And I think hidden beneath these rubber pads is where the screws are that we can gain access to the interior of the device once we unscrew it. So let's try that out. It appears that the glue doesn't hold down the pads too, too well, which is good. That means that it should be easy to reassemble, but it's sticky enough to also put back together. So that's one screw removed. There should be four screws in total in here. So we'll get all four removed from each side. All right, those are tightened down extremely well. Very, very well, so oops, I misaligned that. Uh, there we go, a little bit cleaner now. And, okay. All right, to open this, I assume that we can just pry it open. So I'm just trying to get my fingernails in between the bottom cover and the device itself, just pulling on it pretty hard. There we go, it released very easily. So it has thermal pads that appear to have held it down in place and look at all of this metal. Wow, that is nothing but aluminum. Oh my goodness. All right, let's move this over out of the way. And now this is the underside of the device. And I think if we just maybe try this, it'll fall out. No, it does not. Okay, let's see if we can Oh, um, let's see if we can just pop it up by doing this. Okay, oops. All right, yep, that seems to have done it. And we can flip it over. So this is, goes, this is the Bluetooth connector here on the rear and then the Bluetooth antennae if you're wondering what that wire is. And this is the other side of the device. So they have thermal pads. Oh, well, we've lost one. They have thermal pads on top of our SFP Plus ports. One is still stuck to this piece of aluminum here. So <laughs> you can see that it's stuck there. And then the other one is here. The rest of the device, not too much to look at. Very simple, clean, green PCB. 
Love to see it. Our tiny LED that lights up the Alta Labs logo. So underneath this thermal pad, I believe is the Qualcomm quad core chip. So we can just remove that. And this might be extremely difficult to see on the camera, but looking at it with my naked eye, I can see that it says Qualcomm on it. However, I'm not able to make out any of the other marking text on there. If you wanna see more close-up footage of the actual device itself, I'm gonna post it to the end of the video just to keep the more interesting bits towards the beginning. So let's get this reassembled for now. Try and be very careful not to pinch the wire for the Bluetooth cable. I think I've got everything where it needs to be and we will get everything tightened down again. Now, I don't know what the torque is supposed to be for tightening this thing back down, uh, so hopefully I get that right on my first try, and I probably should have checked the orientation of this before trying to put this back on. Oops. I think it goes like this. Yes, it goes like this. So the A in Alta Labs, the point goes towards the back of the device, and then the two ends here go towards the front of the device. Good job. With the Route 10 reassembled, let's take a look at some of the software features it launched with. And I'm using the keyword here, launch, because there are additional software features coming at a later date. So looking at the list of release features, and I'm not gonna read them all off to you, but I did wanna point out some of the ones that stand out to me the most. We have VLAN and QoS tagging on the WAN, we also have L2TP plus IPsec servers available for our VPN, and you can also set up a Radius server for the IPsec VPN as well to handle all of your users, and a whole bunch more of release features. Taking a look at some of the features in the future will be multi-WAN support, we'll get site-to-site -site VPN support, we'll have a L2TP IPsec client support, open VPN support, dynamic DNS, static routes, WireGuard, IDS, IPS, and a whole other boatload of settings. Some of the big ones being DPI. So obviously some of the future updates that are coming in this device are gonna be very exciting to see when they finally get rolled out, especially things like IDP, IDS, multi-WAN support. I mean, basically the entire list is exciting and something to look forward to. And I, for one, am very excited to get my hands on some of those features, especially site-to-site -site VPN. More on that one in the future. Enough yapping, let's get this thing plugged into the network so we can actually check out the software and see what it's truly capable of. Okay, we have it powered on and I'm going to connect it to my Google Fiber connection. And of course I don't have a patch cable that's long enough, so I'll just use that one. And it lit up immediately. So now we just need to get this connected to our one gigabit switch here. So I'm gonna use this LAN port and plug this into the non-PoE ports. We're gonna be looking at the software for the first time together. So I believe to get to the Route 10, you have to go to 192.168.1.1. And okay, it says it's connected to the internet already, that's good. We can connect to a controller if we had one. Uh, in this case, we do not. Uh, so we're just gonna get, go ahead and skip to setting up the internet connection because I've never seen this before. Um, so we are currently plugged into WAN 1, so click on WAN 1 here. Is your primary, yep, or your DHCP? No, don't do VLAN tagging. No, we don't need to specify a MAC address because that's not how my connection works. Uh, forced Ethernet link speed? No, it should auto-negotiate just fine. And it says it's connecting. It's already connected. Okay, so I think that means all we have to do now is go to manage altainc.com. I'm already logged into my SPX Labs account and everything's already set up here. So we have our site. Let's go over to network. And our S610 is already discovered already on the new subnet of 192.168.1.11. So that's good. Didn't have to do anything there. And our router is set here. So can't change the name. So we'll just hit setup first, get that connected and we'll give it a second to load here. That took just under a minute to get connected and set up. So now we can name it Route 10. There we go. Uh, doesn't seem like there is a firmware update available to it just yet, but um, we will refresh the page and maybe see if we can get some new stuff. All right, we'll let that sit for a little bit. It's still probably trying to connect. I don't know. Um, 
All right, so we have a little network map here. That's pretty cool. So it shows our Route 10, S16, our one device that we have connected currently. We don't really have too many other devices. You can see that there used to be other stuff, but right now nothing else is connected. Um, okay, settings. We could add Wi-Fi, I already have one, but we don't have Wi-Fi set up currently. Time zones, filter, firewall. This stuff is all already there by default. But I believe this port forward slash NAT is new. So if we wanted to do some port forwarding, this would be where we do it. Yep. Source. I've never seen this screen before. Yep. We have our WAN here. Our, our zones. Pretty simple. We can even choose the interface and the interface out. Not too bad. All right. How do we get more settings? Like what if I want to change the subnet and other options? Um, maybe under dashboard. View more. There we go. Okay. All right. Yeah. So we can see that with our WAN uh, one port here is connected. And if we click on that, we could rename it. Apparently uh, we can leave, change it to standard. I wonder what standard means. Is standard mean LAN? Yep. Apparently standard means LAN. Uh, that's a little confusing, but not too big of a deal. So we could change this to a LAN port if we needed or wanted. We're going to leave it as WAN because I'm actually using it. Uh, what does this mean? It's firewall, delete, plus, edit. It's a lot of options. What are all these options? I have no idea what this is. Okay, cool. So here it looks like this is where we could change our... What can we change here? Oh, we can change it from DHCP to static if we wanted to. So that changes the actual WAN port. So we could specify DNSs, set some metrics, enable UPNMP. We're not going to do any of that, Sid. We could change the default speed. Uh, I want to put that on auto. Download limit, none. <laughs> Upload limit, none. And that's on our WAN port. What does this do? OK, it takes us to firewall. D delete, probably deletes. I'm not doing that. Nope, 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 nope. Yes, close. I don't know what I'm doing. Save. OK. All right, so we made that change. Hopefully none other. It looks like we already got a default VLAN. Traffic, click on advanced. Disable acceleration. What is this? For debugging purposes only. Disables hardware network acceleration. OK, not going to do that. We could give our LAN 3 a name. That's interesting. Even change its VLANs if we had any set up. Right now, we don't have any VLAN set up. We only have one VLAN. Set some limits. OK. Easy enough. Um, let's see. So this is authorization. Uh, enables built-in radius server if we wanted. Uh, we're not going to set up radius. Um, right now, of course, as mentioned, one of the launching features is IPsec server. So we could set this up to be a VPN server if we wanted. The temperature is 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Can we change change this from freedom units to communist units? Yep. Okay. So just clicking on the temperature here changes it to communist units. So 39C, that's pretty cool. A little tiny dashboard. All right, all right. Legend. Oh, okay. Here's a legend. It tells us everything. So we have our LAG ports. We have Ubiquity VLAN untagged. That honestly looks like the Ubiquity logo, but that may just be a me thing. Let's see here. TP-Link VLAN is tagged. Okay, so we have untagged. In, okay, all right. Fair enough. Um, how? Okay, so what if what if I did want to change? Subnets. Sorry, I had a little brain fart there. Oh, here we go. Okay, that's how we change it. So, VLAN 1. So, these are all the same. So, this is always the same. So, I could add a second VLAN if I wanted to. Let's say we wanted VLAN 10. Uh, note, we'll, we'll call it the server VLAN. We could set our DHCP range. So, 192.168.10. Slash 24. 
Sweet. Reserved IPs. So let's say we wanted to reserve the first 20 IP addresses. We could do that. So any new IP address assigned will start at 21. Our pool size, we could adjust this if we wanted to. Uh, let's say we wanted to reduce it to 100 for some reason. I'm just going to leave it as 2233 because why not? We set a lease time. We can specify DNS servers. So if you wanted to use um, like 888.9.9 or whatever, 1.1.2.2. I mean, there's tons of options. We could do that. It uh, looks like the default's 1111 or 8888. Those are good choices. Domain name, network domain name. Leave blank for a local domain. So I guess if we had a domain, we could set that. We're going to leave IPv6 off because we don't need it. MDNS repeater. Uh, so we could add that too if we wanted. I'll click on add here because I want to see what this looks like. All right, we added that VLAN. There it is. We have a server VLAN now. Okay, and let's see. We can change our default here. Let's see how quickly this changes. So I'm going to make this... I should have left 10 available. Shoot. We'll do we'll do five. Ugh, I don't want to do five, but we're going to do five. Pool size of 243, least time, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we're, all these default settings are fine. We're going to hit save. And I suspect that everything will break. So let's see what happens. I wonder how long this is going to take to update. So it's, uh, so 1030. All right. We'll, uh, start counting from here. Maybe this should be 5.1 now, hopefully. No changes yet. I wonder, there's no way. Okay. No, it's flashing. You guys can't see this, but it's flashing red. Uh, actually, let's see. Can you guys see that? Oh, it's just out of view. Yeah, so it's flashing kind of like an orange or red right now. I don't know what that means. I think I broke it good. We're going to power cycle, so I'll be right back. Because it's been over a minute. Okay, so after a power cycle, those changes did seem to take effect. I don't know if that's abnormal or normal. Um, it doesn't seem out of the ordinary. And I mean, it's kind of a drastic change, but it looks like we still can't get with the 192.168.5.1, even though that's the IP address for our Route 10. And our S16 isn't reporting an IP address just yet. So it's probably still going through the boot process. So let's hit refresh here. Still says it's disconnected. Um, let's see if I can get an IP address. Oops. Oh my gosh, there's so much stuff. 192. Okay, so I have an IP address of 192.168.511. That's to be expected because we did set the uh, IP range to max out at, or to start at 10. So our S16 now has an IP address of 10. Let's actually see if we can change that. I wonder if we can change where we would change that at. Let's go to devices, dot in here. Um, I have no idea how to do this. I've clearly got a lot to learn with this, maybe if we go to dashboard, click on this, view more. There we go. Change freedom to communist. Not here. Settings, maybe. Linking lights, radius, advanced. Oh, right, right here. DHP, we can set it to static. That's not really part of the route 10. But that's where we would change it. Okay, so back to dashboard. View more so we can get some more settings. Let's drag this over here so it's not blocking all this stuff. So we've changed our default subnet. Uh, a recycle started that. We changed, or we didn't change the reserved IPs, but we could have. 
And I think that's really there, all there is to show right now. Um, I'm not really seeing anything too new. Oh, it didn't keep our freedom units. Or our, our communist units, I mean. That's not cool. Okay, well, yeah, that's pretty much it. It looks like this is going to be pretty sweet. I do like these little uh, modals, I think they're called. Um, so these pop-up windows that you can move around. That's going to be kind of cool. I imagine that you we might have to, you know, change multiple things at once and you can kind of just, you know, move them around as you see fit. That's pretty neat. I definitely, I think that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I guess that's it to show software wise. Let's take a look at power consumption. Power consumption wise, this thing uses very little power when hardly anything is plugged into it. It idles around 6.6 .6 watts. I've had the device running for about 26 hours now in some change, and we can see that it has barely consumed any power at all, giving an estimated cost of only one cent and or five dollars and 78 cents for the entire year so right now at the way we're running it it's not gonna use that much electricity at all so that's good to see according to alta labs if you completely fill all of the ports with other devices non-poe devices by the way it will still idle around nine watts which i'm kind of inclined to believe based off of it only using 6.6 .6 watts however if you plug in poe devices into those same ports of course you're going to use more power and speaking of which it only has a total power budget of 40 watts available to it which is pretty healthy given the size of the device right now i have the alta labs local controller plugged into it and we're using about 11.4 watts with everything sitting idle so i have both of the devices quite literally stacked on top of each other here i know that's hard to see but that is what you are looking at I'll be making more content about this device in the future, specifically how to set this up with different VLANs and subnets and such. And we'll also look at some content like setting up site-to-site -site VPNs and probably just playing around with VPNs in general. And if there's anything that you guys are in per particularly interested in, drop a comment below, let me know what it is. So that way I can probably make a video about it. No promises, but I'll definitely consider it depending on what your request is. So with all that being said, I wanna thank each and every one of you for watching and I will see you all next time. Peace.